Yeah. When you, one of my most vivid uh, memories of those okay, days. Sorry. Can we just start it over? Sure. All right. No. One of my most vivid memories of those days in the Southern Tenant Farmers Union uh, began, it started really very early and, and was quite important in every possible way. Uh, I'd only been there perhaps a week when Mitchell said, uh, now we're going to go out into the countryside and I want you to meet some people who are very active in the union, Uncle Charlie McCoy. And so I was looking forward to it. I, I was a city girl and I didn't know a lot about the country. Uh, we arrived at a pleasant little you know, cabin-type place with a tree in the yard and a picnic table, and I sat down to the table uh, for a noon meal with black and white sharecroppers, and I had never so much as shaken hands with a black person, much less had a meal with them, and I... First, I must admit, my first thought was, oh, what would Mother say if she could see me now? And then I realized, I then, as uh, uh, I think this was part of the whole reason I was there, because the racism that existed in my hometown, which is New Orleans, had just never, ne never made it with me. I seemed to have been born without it, and so this was just wonderful, one of the great things that happened to me. Can you tell me about the demands and the vision of, of the union, and if possible, look at me a little? Well, I, I wanted to be part of this because it seemed to be a possible dream. Uh, there, there aren't very many uh, that are. Um, I had spent a lot of time reading poetry and, and uh, philosophy and all those things, and here was a chance to be part of something that could work and that might work and people cared enough about it to make it work. The, these people were perhaps oh, undoubtedly the poorest people in America, and the people who had no chance uh, as their situation was set up, but they were willing to try to change it and the people I was working with were willing to try to change it and it seemed worth doing. What exactly was the union demanding? Well, the union was demanding decent uh, um, living conditions uh, at that time. I don't know, but today we wouldn't think so. They were, well, they were asking for 25 cents a day for workers, uh, or 20, a dollar, no, 25 cents an hour, a dollar fifty a day uh, for workers uh, for a 10-hour day in the fields. At least that's what the strike demands were when they called a strike. Uh, they were asking for uh, a fair deal uh, for workers. And uh, the only way that they could get it was joining together in an organization. Great. Can you tell me about the near lynching in Earl with Howard Kester and Herman Goldberger? Mm -hmm. Well, another one of my adventures in the field was the day that I went with uh, Howard Kester, who was a um, an evangelical preacher, Presbyterian, I think, and uh, Goldberg, who was the union's lawyer. We went from Memphis to a little town in Earl, Arkansas, where there was a uh, to be a meeting of the union uh, in a small church. Uh, I uh, was I wanted to go in, but uh, uh, Kester and, and Goldberger insisted that I stay in the car and lock the car securely before they went in. Uh, they knew that there might be violence. I knew that there might be violence uh, because the day, the night before, we had met with some people, and they they were afraid and they had wanted to fight back, and we had counseled them uh, to be absolutely uh, passive. Uh, passive resistance, if anything, but at least not to fight back. So as I was sitting, and they'd just gone into the church, I saw a group of, um, of riding bosses, dressed men dressed in khaki and carrying uh, clubs uh, coming down the road, and uh, I knew this was going to be it. Almost immediately after they went into the little church, the windows burst open and the glass was shattering and people were jumping out. And in a little while, they and I, I saw them strike people. I saw them strike one old man. I vividly remember that. Uh, people were just running and getting away as fast as they could. 
And then two men came out, uh, one on each side of, of Kester and Goldberger, and brought them to the car, um, put them in it, got on the running board. We still had running boards in those days, and um, uh, drove us uh, out of town. I remember it because I had the feeling, uh, and I, I know that uh, we'd heard of lynches and, and seen pictures of them, but this is the first time I knew what it might be really like because there was a palpable feeling of hate and fear, and uh, it was pretty, pretty terrible. They stopped um, finally uh, out of town near the, near the border, and uh, uh, somehow reason prevailed, and they threatened us with uh, 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 worse than death if we ever came back, uh, and uh, left us at the border between uh, um, Arkansas and uh, Memphis, and, uh, and we left. I think it was possibly because I was a woman, and, and all that legend of Southern uh, chivalry that may have prevented there being a lynching, but I was as close to one as I ever want to be. Did they also think you were a reporter? Yes, I didn't know that at the time, but that uh, uh, they did uh, uh, actually say, and if, if anything comes out in that press cemetery paper, you know, there's going to be trouble, because they thought, but maybe that's that's who I was. That I was a reporter from the, the press amateur. That was wonderful. Mm -hmm. um, can you tell me the story of uh, Frank Weems' disappearance during the chopper strike in mm -hmm. 1936? Mm -hmm. Well, I I don't know a great deal about it. Uh, um, I spent most of my time in the office uh, during those those days. But of course, we all knew about it because uh, he was reported as having disappeared. Can you say who uh, Frank Weems, yeah. Uh, Frank Weems was reported as having disappeared. Uh, however, uh, uh, shall I uh, go on now? Or yes, you want to I'm sorry. Okay, all right. Uh, we, uh, uh, you know, went through all the usual r routines of, of asking uh, when he was seen last and what, what had happened. And uh, it seemed um, certain that he must have, have been killed. Uh, our people had been before, and perhaps his body was in the bayou. And that was the belief, actually, for some time. Um, the much later, oh, in fact, I guess a year or so later, uh, I went with Mitchell to uh, to Illinois, uh, actually, because we had heard that possibly he was still alive, but uh, we didn't find him, and whether that was so or not. But certainly, it it was a uh, a, a very emotional period. You know, I didn't catch with um, Can you can you say um, what it felt like to be looking for this man with Mitchell, who you didn't know if um, if he was alive, if he was at the bottom of the bayou, what that felt like. It's a little, little hard to um, to really um, um, know what your feelings are at a time like this. I didn't know Frank Weems personally, but I knew a lot of people like Frank Weems, and he could have been one of any of the people that I had traveled with, uh, eaten with, stayed with, and and uh, I felt devastated. Um. Can you talk about how the union went about trying to get national attention and the success that you had in that? One of the uh, reasons um, I think that uh, the nation sort of focused on our union uh, uh, at that period and part of that period was because Mitchell particularly was an extremely capable uh, publicist. He really knew how to write letters, he knew how to reach people. Um, and we had become, after uh, some of the incidents that had been publicized and some of the visits that our people had made to Washington and to New York, we'd really become the, um, um, the live laboratory where you could learn what it was like to be a, a poor sharecropper or a poor southerner. And many people came uh, to visit and went back with stories that, yes, it's, it's true. These are people who are 
uh, living in abject poverty, but are struggling to get out of it. Okay. Um, shortly after you arrived, um, the I guess the strike ended shortly before you arrived in Memphis. Um, and you talked about the enthusiasm and like the, the growth in the union. Can you tell me about that? Well, I used to get letters. Uh, uh, I went uh, primarily to uh, be the office secretary and set things up and help, but I, I became uh, many other things, including the uh, um, sort of head of the women's auxiliary organization. And so I got a lot of letters, both from, uh, from women in the field and from men, and some of those are on record in various libraries. But uh, there was obviously uh, a great surge of enthusiasm and, and uh, our conventions were, were very large. I remember Cotton Plant, Arkansas, we filled a church. There must have been several hundred people there. The same thing was true at a convention in Oklahoma. Uh, so it, it, um, we had a lot of members. What kinds of um, things did the sharecroppers write you? Sorry? Uh, yeah. oh, we ran out of film. <laughs> Mark. Another dramatic event. Uh, I'm, you're, I'm sorry, that's my okay. fault. It's all right. Okay. Are you ready? Okay. Another dramatic event during the 1936 um, uh, strike, the sharecropper strike, uh, was a disappearance of one of our most active organizers, a man named Frank Weems. Uh, he had uh, um, not been seen for some time, uh, and the fear uh, and almost certainty was that uh, he had been killed uh, and his body thrown into the bayou. Uh, this was, um, was a very difficult time for everyone and, um, uh, because there was fear and there was sorrow, and uh, although I didn't know him, uh, he was, uh, he could have been any one of the people I did know well, the, the black men that I had gone on trips with, that I had learned to know and, and uh, respect. And so I felt pretty devastated. Um, we later found out that perhaps he was still alive. I went on a trip looking uh, in Illinois because we had, had heard that. But there was a very, uh, it was a very bad time for all of us. Okay. Yesterday you were telling me that the union only went places that, that black and white members could stay. Can you tell me about that? Well, we did make trips uh, because Mitchell, uh, for one, would decide on the spur of the moment. Uh, and uh, uh, I was always happy to decide on the spur of the moment, too, to go on a trip. But one of the things, one of the reasons we, we rode so much and took such long trips without stopping was because we were all absolutely consistent about not stopping anywhere, spending the night or having a meal anywhere that both black and whites could go because we always traveled together. And that was, that was how we became uh, comrades and brothers. <laughs> Great. Can you describe H.L. Mitchell? Well, I've, I've described H.O. Mitchell um, um, to myself and to others uh, several times. I, I, I knew him at many different uh, stages of his life. Uh, when he was uh, quite young, uh, he, uh, I was 21 and he was uh, not much older, I think he was uh, under 30, when I arrived uh, in, in Memphis. He was a, a very uh, attractive, young, slim, uh, boyish-looking man with a lock of hair that fell down over one eye. And um, he had the uh, vernacular uh, of the South, uh, the drawl. Uh, I'm not sure that he didn't learn to, um, uh, to exaggerate it a little um, later on. Uh, he uh, he was kind. He he made me uh, feel at home. He was uh, charming. Uh, he he was very very able and very very dedicated. I think there wasn't anything else in the world as important to him as as the union, and this continued, not only in his young years but later because he is a person that if this 
interview was dedicated to anyone, it should be dedicated to Mitch, because he was a person who kept us all together, who saved the letters, who wrote the people, who got in touch with the libraries, who, who made a lot of things possible. Um, tell me about his new cars. Oh, yes. Uh, Mitch, uh, uh, there, there were other, other aspects that sometimes uh, people might have been a little critical about. Uh, Mitch always dressed pretty well and uh, always looked uh, pretty neat. And he told me that uh, this was because, he said, the, uh, the union members want me to look like a boss. They don't want me to look like a sharecropper. And he also uh, drove uh, a good car, uh, which he turned in every year for a good, also a new car. He began this practice when his old jalopy was retired because members of the Socialist Party in New York were afraid he couldn't get away fast enough uh, if he continued to drive it, and they gave him a new Chevrolet, which he then uh, continued to use. In fact, I think he always used a Chevrolet and usually a new one, and it, we always made these long trips in it. Can you tell me um, about the office environment? What did it feel like on a typical day? Well, the office was upstairs in, on, a, on a little street in Memphis, uh, uh, dark entrance uh, um, um, with um, a wooden stairway going up. Um, I, I really remember its smell. I don't know why I remember smells, but I do. It, all, it always smelled like cabbage. Uh, there was a family uh, upstairs at the end of the hall um, that played hillbilly music most of the time as well and probably cooked cabbage. Uh, the office itself was uh, two rooms, uh, uh, very uh, full of tables and, and a typewriter or two, and we had a, um, an old Xerox machine. We called them mimeograph machines in those days. Uh, we also had a number of leaks Whenever it rained, we had to run for the buckets to put under the leaks. Um, it was uh, it was not the coziest of places, but um, uh, everybody. We spent a lot of time there, and I sat in smoke-filled rooms. Everyone would would die at just the thought of it today, because whenever we had meetings and the folks came in for meetings. They smoked or they chewed, and they, we also had spittoons, and we also had people uh, spitting t tobacco juice, and uh, I guess there was a bit of snuff around, and there were lots of cigarettes, uh, um, and I managed uh, to survive <laughs> during that whole time. That's great. Did Mitchell have a sense that he was making history as it was happening? Um, I think that Mitchell must have known that he was making history because he was a, he was a very clever man. He had uh, no formal education, uh, but he was uh, well-read. He had um, actually studied a lot of, of things, materials that were available to him. Uh, he knew what he was doing. Um, he persisted. In, in the things that he was doing. And I, uh, I think that uh, he lived to see a lot of his dreams realized because uh, we may not have cured all the problems, but we certainly did make a difference. How do you, how do you mean? I th well, I think we made a difference in, in uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the Roosevelt New Deal. I think we made a difference in all the reforms that were made um, um, by the government agencies. We certainly made a difference in the fact that, that the world knew that there were these poor people uh, and black and white sharecroppers in the South. Now, originally when you came to the Union, you were going to stay a month. You stayed five years, and why was it so special to you? Well, I, I, I came for a month uh, because I wanted to, uh, well, I wanted to know what, whether, whether the things that I believed as a young socialist uh, were true, were possible, what it was really like. Uh, I, I think I probably, as a person, have always wanted to be involved directly rather than simply to, to hear about it. And while I was there, I, I 
a month would have certainly, I was just beginning to get the file set up by then, and um, there, were, there were just, it, it was much more than a university could have given me in every way. I, I learned more about uh, humanity, I learned more about economics, I learned more about uh, writing. Uh, I got my first lesson in how to write a press release when I was there, and it stood me in good stead all my all the rest of my life. Uh, so it it I met people that I will never forget that I would never have met uh, anywhere if I had not uh, been there. Uh, the uh, the Negro preachers, the uh, um, uh, all of these people who who were um, wonderful people. So I, I just wish my own children had, had the opportunity to do something of this kind. Can you tell us? Okay. Are we... okay. Yes. Well, perhaps of all of the so-called, uh, perhaps you might call them Yankee outsiders, uh, I don't think there was any, I'm sure there was no one who had as much uh, influence and impact as Norman Thomas did. Uh, among the, the um, inner circle of the um, um, uh, organizers, Butler, who was president of the union, Mitchell, Kester, uh, Ward Rogers, myself, most of us had come to this point in our own lives uh, because of the influence of Norman Thomas. Um, uh, he represented uh, uh, the, thing, the kind of person and the kind of reforms that all of us believed in, and, and all of us believed in Norman. In fact, when we sang, we shall not be moved sometime at conventions, we also sang, Norman Thomas is our leader, we shall not be moved. Uh, but Norman was known to most of the uh, uh, key organizers and certainly to uh, all of the office staff. He did make several trips. Uh, it was a new experience for him to, to be treated rather roughly at times uh, in, in the field and right. was educational for him. That was good. We're out of film. We're just going to change roles. All right. Perhaps one of our biggest and most effective pieces of publicity uh, we didn't really have much to do with because uh, the March of Time, the, which was then a, um, a newsreel uh, uh, Time Life uh, magazine, I presume, uh, decided to make a film and reenact scenes from the strike uh, and um, uh, other aspects of the union organization. Uh, they sent uh, from New York, uh, the man who was in charge of it was a man named Jack Glenn, who I remember was a very, very pleasant, uh, cordial fellow, and, and uh, we talked a lot. Um, and so I knew at least what was going on, although I was not actually involved in, in, in the film itself. Uh, the, there were some uh, actors, some uh, people who, who were uh, actually hired to do a few of the scenes, uh, however, uh, and some of those were those who, who did a march, which reenacted what took place during the strike, um, in the early days of the strike, when people were, when they were trying to get people to come out of the fields. Local organizers and local people did conduct these strikes, and those were reenacted uh, by the March of Time. However, there were uh, scenes with real staff members, uh, certainly there were scenes in the office, and I remember scenes around the table with a number of people who were actually involved in the union, so they were not all actors. It was apparently a, a, a pretty successful um, piece of, um, of news coverage because uh, it continued to be shown uh, for many, many years, and, uh, and there certainly were repercussions as a result of it as there were from other, other publications, articles in The Nation, uh, articles in, in Time uh, uh, magazine, particularly at the time of the Frank Williams uh, problem. So uh, this was, was another aspect of publicizing that was very good. Great. Can you tell me the story that Mitchell told you about the first meeting 
and the decision to become an interracial union? Yes, I can tell you a little of it because it's it's very easy to visualize. Uh, I think um, there were I Can you forgot. Start over yeah. The first oh, oh yes. Okay. Uh, uh, Mitchell uh, has told me uh, about the very first meeting when the union really organized, and it's it's very easy to visualize. Uh, because uh, one can easily imagine this small group, I, I believe 17, I'm never good at numbers, but I think that was the number, uh, who met in this little uh, church, and I don't know where it was now, um, uh, somewhere near Taranza, Arkansas, where Mitch was. And uh, I talked about the possibility of organizing a union to address the problems that, that, that everyone was experiencing. And there were both black and white people there. And um, uh, most people know that uh, even before the civil rights movement, uh, there were real problems. And this didn't happen very often that people got together. But they did at this time. And there was some discussion as to whether there should be a, a, a black uh, organization and a white organization sort of working parallel. However, one man. Mitch told me, got up, a white man who said that he had belonged to the Ku Klux Klan in the past and uh, uh, that, however, he felt that this was a situation where they were all in this together and there wasn't any way to get out except together and he was all for having a union of black and white sharecroppers. And this certainly was a historic uh, organization, a historic thing to do, because they decided that night that 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 is what it would be, and it was certainly that. Can you just tell me that part about um, the man who said he was in the Klan? It was actually his grandfather who was in the Klan. His grandfather was in the Klan. Okay, all right. Okay, you know, all right. Uh, uh, just start again from. Just, right. you want to just say there was one white man who stood up. Yeah, the white a white man who stood up uh, said that his grandfather had been a member of the Ku Klux Klan, but that he realized the importance of people working together and that uh, they must be together as both black and white uh, in the organization. Okay. Um, can, can, I, just, uh, can, can we stop them? Okay. I've been asked um, what what is the aspect of, of this whole experience of which I am most proud? And that's, that's a kind of funny word to have to deal with, because pride is, 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 isn't the easiest thing to talk about as a concept. But I, th I think I can do that because uh, I think I probably am, am most proud of the fact that I was able to uh, uh, accommodate myself to the situations uh, that I faced, that I was able to take advantage of the absolutely terrific uh, opportunities that were presented to me uh, to learn about human beings, to uh, value them, uh, to be part of a uh, movement that was, that offered hope and, and uh, in a in a at a time that um, everyone needed that, uh, I think that I, I I am proud of the fact that I was uh, chosen to do it and that I uh, I was able to continue and and also to continue those associations uh, until uh, today or until Mitchell, who died only a very few years ago and with whom I was in contact uh, uh, always throughout the, all this time. Was there one planter who was worse than all the others, who would evict people, you know, without a second thought? Oh, uh, yes, but I can't, I, I can't think of any one planter, but I can certainly think of one individual uh, who was the uh, villain of the piece and who certainly scared the uh, bejesus out of me, and that was Paul Peacher, who was a, uh, uh, a deputy uh, sheriff 
uh, in, um, oh, I've forgotten which, which county it was, but who also kept a, uh, a, a farm in which he, uh, he, he arrested people and then kept them in peonage to work on the farm. He was later convicted, probably the only man in the USA ever convicted of peonage. Uh, and I, in my youthful uh, innocence and ignorance, volunteered to go down with another young woman and um, take some pictures uh, of the pin of the farm. And so we'd have the uh, have the goods on Paul Peacher. And we did indeed go, and we parked outside the uh, uh, the place and climbed the fence and went in and was walking down the path uh, with my camera when who should appear but Paul Peacher with his gun and uh, who immediately wanted to know what we were doing there and we said we were looking for a place for a picnic uh, in which he took my camera, uh, uh, took the film out, threw it away, threatened us uh, with all sorts of things and saw that we got back in the car and left. So he, he, he sort of represents to me the, uh, the kind of person that, that was pretty bad. Can you tell me um, what, how it felt to be a socialist in the 30s? Hmm. Ah, it felt good to be a socialist in the 30s. I think it felt better than to be a, a, a member of any political party uh, in the uh, whatever where, where we are now. <laughs> uh, uh, because um, there was there was a feeling that uh, that things were possible. Uh, that you could make a difference, that you could change things, that uh, uh, people uh, could work together, that there was there was good in in every man, that uh, that we could be brothers. Um, uh, I think that that a lot of it, uh, it's at least for me, uh, uh, political theory wasn't so very important, but the feeling of people working together. And caring about each other and and having a dream and a vision was important, and that I'm very glad I had. Um, did you feel that FDR and the federal government were behind you and the sharecroppers? Well, not uh, I didn't didn't always feel that the federal government and FDR were were behind us. Uh, I think that uh, uh, there was a bit of that, certainly with FDR. Uh, because uh, political situations are, are are always more complicated than that, and and they were not always behind us. Eleanor Roosevelt was always behind us. I don't. I wouldn't say that FDR was. Uh, certainly, Eleanor Roosevelt uh, was very much a supporter of the organization. Do you remember when FDR came to Arkansas in 1936 to speak on behalf of Senator Robinson? I don't remember when uh, FDR came to uh, Arkansas. I, that I don't know. Do you remember any evictions? Oh, yes. I, cer I certainly remember the evictions. Um, in fact, um, um, I, I visited, uh, in fact, visited with Norman Thomas, uh, uh, one man who was evicted uh, uh, from the uh, plantation, and he was one of many. Uh, I think his name was Benny Fleming, and who was living along the roadside, uh, and he was actually the uh, uh, sort of um, the the germ in a way for what later grew into the Delta Cooperative Farm in Mississippi, because another person who heard about the plight of the sharecropper was Dr. Sherwood Eddy, who was uh, an important uh, uh, minister and and leader of a of a church group, uh, who sent uh, another young minister down to stay overnight with this, uh, in this tent colony with Benny Fleming, and uh, later raised money to start a farm of black and white sharecroppers. Great. That did it. Yeah. That's it. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs>